I want to deal this morning, and I want you to listen carefully as I introduce this message, because if uh, you uh, did not get the introduction, you'll certainly not get the conclusion. And I, I say this seriously. Uh, we as Baptists would fight you for the deity of Christ, and that's good. But sometimes, somehow, some way, we, uh, we have not... Uh, dealt with the humanity of Christ uh, adequately in my opinion that's my opinion that we haven't dealt with it adequately when you look at the uh, Christ as a son of God uh, of course you do not have an example that you and I can follow but when you look at him as the son of man you definitely have an example by which you and I can follow. And if he was not the Son of Man, as well as the Son of God, then you and I do not have a Savior. And so I want to deal with uh, Jesus this morning as the Son of Man. And I, I think in dealing with him as the Son of Man, we will um, see that there's some foundational truth laid out for us that I believe will be of eternal value to us. I, I really, in my own heart, I really wish that I could have received this message. As far as I know, I never even heard it. And I don't, uh, if I did hear it, I could not receive it. Back through the years, really. I, um, I, I really don't know exactly when the Lord let me put this together. Uh, back through the years, but it wasn't the earlier part of my life. And this morning there's be some emphasis in this message, even though you may have heard me preach along this line, that I think uh, I, I, there's some emphasis today that I want to deal with that I don't think you have heard. Uh, of course, it's, uh, I'm almost one of those people that believe there's nothing new under the sun except some phase of history you haven't read. And uh, I think some president said that one time. But um, what I mean by that is the fact that um, a lot of times we know a lot of things we don't understand. And we have to, have to come along and get understanding about what we know before we can share it. Uh, what I want to do is uh, really just take you to the passage where we find Jesus Christ as the Son of Man, his last uh, words, just his last words, and begin there and move into his life. And that's found in John 19. The um, preachers, when I was a little boy, I, I went to a Baptist church one Sunday and a Methodist church the next Sunday. <coughs> And I don't remember whether this came out of Baptist Church or Methodist Church. But in those days, you could pretty well depend on both of them to be pretty close to being right. And um, they would say to me, I never will forget it. They'd say to me, you know, a preacher in the pulpit. They'd say Jesus Christ was all man. And I, I could handle that. I, I, you know, I didn't understand it, but I could handle it. And then they turn around and say, he's all God. And, of course, that, uh, putting those together, it added a little confusion. How about, I don't know how many years has passed since I heard that, and I don't know that I can still uh, explain it. But I don't know that I have to explain it. Uh, I know that I need to accept it. And so there's no question in my mind that Jesus Christ was the Son of Man and he was the Son of God, as God. But I want us to look at him as the Son of Man this morning because he leaves us a perfect example of how to do things, how to be what we're supposed to be and how to do what we're supposed to do. And as far as I can tell, this is the last words of him in the flesh as the Son of Man. And we find him hanging on the cross, not a beautiful scene at all. And um, it says in the 28th verse this, now listen to this carefully. 
After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, and that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now, that I thirst is even a fulfillment of the scripture, but I want you to notice the fact that all scripture now has been fulfilled. And there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled the sponge with vinegar, and put it up on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Jesus Christ leaves us an example of what I consider victory. You see, he came into this world and took up on him a body, a flesh. And Jesus Christ, as the Son of Man, lived in such a way that he fulfilled everything that was written about him in this book. Everything that was written about him in this book, as the Son of Man, he fulfilled it. Now, he did not fulfill this as the Son of God. He fulfilled this as the Son of Man. And that's very important. When he said it's finished, he had fulfilled all Scripture. Now, when it's over, listen to me carefully, it can be said of him what was written of him. Now, to me, that is victory. Victory is having it said of you what's written of you in this book. Victory. I, we, you may not realize how important it is to have victory. I first heard this statement, I, it shook me. But I've pondered it for the years, and I know it's true. Unless you, as a child of God, have victory in your life, you do not have a testimony that you're saved by the grace of God. Now, I didn't say you weren't saved. Because I know a saved person can be defeated. The Bible teaches it can. But, beloved, the world only knows that you're saved when they see you having victory. The reason to believe that you know what you're talking about when you say you're saved and you're defeated on it is not having adversity. Our tendency is and went to school with him in 50 and he can't even think of his name um, but I, I, I don't know I, some people are preaching a victory today that when you have victory you have no more problems but I don't find that in the Bible I don't find it anywhere in the Bible in fact I do not find that you can be in the perfect will of God and be a boy, uh, be uh, free from problems in fact you get in the perfect will of God you might get in a big bunch of them but um, victory is having it said of you what's written of you in this book See, the, Paul, the Bible says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It doesn't say work because, it doesn't say work to get saved, but because you are saved by the grace of God, what's in you, work it out. Work it out. Learn how to fulfill the scripture. Learn how to obey the truth. Learn how to walk with God. So, my dear friends, you can have victory in every kind of life, every kind of circumstances, every kind of situation you find yourself in. You have victory. And when people see you having that victory in all the different facets and assets of activities of life, when they see you have victory, then they have a reason to believe that you're really genuinely saved by the grace of God. And victory becomes a very significant part of the Christian life. If you don't think so, you, you think about all that's written in the Bible just to the Christian. The greatest portion of the scripture, my dear friends, is not dealing with salvation, but dealing with sanctification and service. And all of that pertains to victory. It's how much of the epistles uh, from Paul is written to the Christian as to how they ought to live. So having victory is a very important factor. Being an overcomer is quite an important factor. And I say that no man really has a testimony 
that they're saved by the grace of God unless they have victory. And what am I saying victory is? Victory is you living in such a way that when it comes to the end of your life it can be said of you what is written of you. You see, there's a lot of things that's written about you and me in this book. And I won't mention all of them this morning. I may just mention a couple. One thing that's written of you and me in this book this morning is that we're saints. Amen. The moment you got saved by the grace of God, you became a saint. You don't have to be sainted way down to three or four, five hundred years when everybody's forgot how wicked you were. My dear friends, the moment you got saved by the grace of God, you, you became a saint. That's a positional position. But it may be, my dear friends, that you are not saintly. But the Bible says victory is having it said of you what's written of you, and it is written that you're a saint. And you and I need to adjust ourselves to God to where we walk in such a way with Him that folk will say, boy, there is a saint. That man, that woman is a saint. That girl, that boy is a saint. Because they have to, they can see it. And I got news for you. If you have to tell someone you're a saint, folk, you need to keep your mouth shut. I'm not talking about the fact you shouldn't witness. You should witness. But I'm telling you one thing. If there's not a life that backs that witness up, you haven't got much. So the Bible does teach us that we need to have victory. And, it needs, and victory is having it said of us what's written of us. And we're definitely saints. We are saints. Is it said of you what's written of you? You see, you can come up here to this church house or your church wherever you go and, and act like a saint for three hours a week. But the real issue is what your husband calls you, what your wife calls you. The real issue is what your children call you. The real issue, my dear friends, is what the people that work with you call you. What do they say about you? Victory is having a set of you what's written of you in this book. There's another thing that's said about us. That we're a priest. Now, I'm just going to mention these two just to give you an idea of where I'm headed. The Bible says that we're a priest. Now, when I was a boy, I was reared to believe that a person that was a priest had a collar on backwards, and that is about the extent of my definition of a priest. But since then, I have uh, learned that a priest is something very simple and yet something so profound. A priest is simply a go-between, a vehicle. A priest is someone, I love this definition, that knows how to reach out and get hold of man with all of his need and reach up and get hold of God with all of his supply and bring the two together. Amen. Now, the Bible says that you're a priest. But what does people say about you? We have a sort it's almost a cliche. It's just, it's certainly a byword almost. Uh, we have, when we greet each other before we leave, pray for me. Pray for me. You might be like one man who came to me one time. Uh, you could stop that stuff pretty easily. Quit being a hypocrite about it. A man came to me one time and said, Brother Manley said, I have a son-in-law and daughter. Out of, they, they, their home is all messed up. They have separated. He said, would you pray for them? And I said, uh, what do you mean? He said, well, don't you pray? They'll get back together. I said, I can't pray like that. He said, why? I said, because I wouldn't want to waste my time. Well, I got him off of a norm, and uh, so he was all ears, and he said, what do you mean? I said, I'll tell you what I will do. I will pray that regardless of the cost, whatever it takes to get glory out of that situation. I said, I can pray, and they get back together and still be full of the devil. Yeah, yeah. right. But if I pray that God will get glory and honor out of that situation, they get right with God, very likely they're going to get back together. But we have a byword almost pray for me. 
And we don't mean to think about it, but I'm going to tell you something. When you get facing death, yes. and when you get facing there's no other way out, folks, you start looking for people, not who say, when they pass you, pray for me, I'll pray for you. That crowd falls along the wayside, folks. Right. And you start looking for the few people in this world that knows how to reach up and get hold of God with one hand and your need with the other and bring the two together. Amen. Are you known as a priest? Are you? Is it said of you what's written of you in this book? Is it really genuinely said you, she's a priest? Is it really said he's a priest? He said, well, Brother Man, I don't even know how to pray. God says, they didn't have to know how. He said, the Spirit of God will do it if you'll let him. We have no reason whatsoever for not being a priest. What do people say about you? Victory is having it said of you what's written of you. Yes, sir. James A. Stewart used to say when they got ready to interview someone about being a missionary, one of the first things they asked them was, do you get your prayers answered? If they said yes, they say, show me. He said if they didn't know how to pray and get answers to the prayers, he said he, he knew they wouldn't make it. You know, we put praying in the context that you have never prayed till you have the answer for what you're praying, either in your hand or in your heart. We cut out a lot of foolish stuff. Back some years ago, my wife and I had an experience. We've never gotten over it. Of course, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's very difficult to keep a dad and mother off of bragging on their kids. But uh, we have four children. The youngest one is John. He was um, born in Mississippi, raised a lot of time right here. Uh, he's the only one of our kids who weren't country kids. He's a whole new breed. He knows no meaning about money. He thinks his dad is rich. He got saved when he was 14 years old, and he really has been a, a most delightful person. We learned how in the first three, and we have enjoyed this fourth. And he's been a very delightful experience. He has really been. When he got saved, and I say this without trying to build my own son up, to magnify him, but friend, I have never known a soul winner like him in my life as a kid. I can take you not to one boy, but I can take you to dozens of boys that are scattered all over America tonight, doctors and lawyers, engineers, pilots, that John led to Jesus personally and stayed with them until they were separated geographically. And they're still walking. That's right. I have never seen anything like that. One day, a couple of years ago, for Christmas time, I walked in the kitchen. There stood five young men. You know, when they're in the living room, they're acquaintances. When they're in the den, they're friends. But when they're in the kitchen, they're family. Now, there was five young men standing there. One of them is a doctor in Houston, Texas today. One of them is a preacher finishing Crystal Bible Institute. One of them is assistant to the chaplain of Texas A&M right now becoming a jet test pilot for the Marine Corps and the other two are in universities 
training for specialization. All five of them living for Jesus. And this boy led him to the Lord. The one that you day of him called one morning about 2.30. At that time, I guess John was 19 years of age. He's about 19. He called and said, I want John's number. He didn't ask Martha and I asked John's sister for John's number. Between Martha and I, we have over 80 years of Christian history. And far as I know, folks, we've had hell by the acre. But every speck of it has turned to victory and glory. Amen. Yes, sir. But that boy did not want to talk to Mr. and Mrs. Beasley. He wanted to talk to John. It shook me and it blessed me at the same time. When he got a hold of John at the university he's in, he said, John, today, my brother that's a jet pilot, test pilot for the Marine Corps, his dad had been a test pilot for the Marine Corps. His dad, they live up the street from us on a bank. They have everything this world has to offer, but they do not have Jesus. And John had led this boy to the Lord. And he said, John, he said, today, my oldest brother was doing some maneuvers in this jet and got it over on its back. And he could not maneuver it anymore. And there's only one way out, and that was to shoot himself out. And he was so close to the ground that he shot himself into the ground and killed himself. And he said there was no other way out. And he said to him, hey, my family doesn't know the Lord. And I want, I want you to pray. He said, this boy, last Christmas I led him to the Lord. He died. He said, as far as I know, he's the only one saved. He said, would you pray? He said, Brother Man, that's something. I'll tell you what's something. Is that that boy would pass up almost 80 years of Christian history in a bedroom and go to a 19-year-old boy. Because who knew that boy? Can you try to get a hold of God with one hand? And here's the need for the other. And bring the two together. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How are you known? What's being said of you? Doesn't take a big education to do that, folks. It doesn't take you knowing a lot. What's it said of you? What's written of you? Is it? That is the truth. It's written we're saints. It's written we're priests. How much more is it written of us? So much more is it said of you. So he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So my dear friends, your position in Christ and the reality of your life becomes united in one. So it's written of you what is said of you, what is written of you. That is victory. That is victory. And until you and I have this victory, folks, the world does not know we are saved by the grace of God. That's right. I didn't say you were lost, but they do not know you're saved till they can see that victory. Oh, not them, but not not that. Amen. 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 Yes, sir, folks. Yes, sir. Trouble will never hand. They're always overcoming. Oh, the world knows then. That's right. Amen. Amazing thing about it is Jesus had the victory as the Son of Man. You say, well, how in the world would that fit us? Because we're looking at him as the Son of Man now, not as the Son of God. How did he do it? He had to do it as the Son of Man. He had to do it by the, as the Son of Man, so he did it as the Son of Man feel with God. Amen. How did he relate to God as the Son of Man? Are you listening carefully? My friends, Jesus Christ... He put it this way. 
He said, I do nothing except what I see my father do. He said, my father judges, I judge it. Jesus, one objective in life. He said, my meat is to do the will of my father. This thing of walking with God. I'm going to chase a rabbit here for just a moment, if you don't mind. This thing of walking with God, my dear friends, is always individualistic. And it's always personally related to the person of Christ. And if you aren't careful, you will come up with a designed formula by which, my friends, you can go through religious activity and totally disregard God completely and become a God yourself by your good works. Now, I can make it very personal, but I'll give you a general idea. These folks that take the doctrine of healing and say, if you're sick, you're full of the devil. Yeah. And my dear friends, therefore, everybody can be healed, and they pray without any reservation whatsoever. Without any reservation whatsoever, they pray in faith for everybody to be healed. You know what those people are doing? They are disregarding the first first law of walking with Christ. Yeah. And that is this, they have made a God out of a doctrine instead of paying the price of personally walking with Jesus Christ to discover what is his will about every given situation. And he is not their Lord, they are. Amen. They're talking about the will of God and they're completely forsaking the person of Christ and his sovereignty as to what he wants in every given situation. Jesus never did that. That's right. He never did anything except what the Father initiated. Why is that so important? Well, my friends, our fellowship is with a person, Mm -hmm. not a creed. Our fellowship is with a person. Not a friend. That person is Christ. It's individualistic. It's personal. Jesus, listen to me carefully now. He never initiated one involvement in his life. He always allowed the Father to initiate his involvement. Let me tell you something. God does not stand by what he does not initiate. And what he initiates, he doesn't stand by. If you violate the principles of walking with him. Some people say, well, God started it, he'll finish it. He'll finish it, but it won't be in you. Unless you stay right in line. He may start the race and you may get in the race. But if you do not run that race lawfully, you're disqualified. So this whole idea, well, if he started, he'll finish it. No, not in you. Unless you keep things in order. I want to tell you something, folks. This number one point. The Lord never did anything except what the Father initiated. See, his meat was to do the will of the Father. So he never did anything to the Father initiated it. You and I need to settle that issue once and for all. And we need to continue to settle it. We need to know who has initiated our involvement. You say, why? It's your strongest argument for victory in the hour of defeat. If you know he has initiated it, all you have to do is go back and remind him and remind yourself and very likely remind the devil. And usually when you get back there, a great deal of the battle is over. If you had a 10-story building and number one story wasn't in there, what kind of building would you have? 
your second story, third, and fourth, fifth story cannot be any stronger than your first. And my dear friends, you cannot run out here and initiate a bunch of stuff in your life and then beg God to have mercy on it. I think about a man by the name of Abraham and Sarah. God had told Abraham and Sarah that he was going to make them a father of another of a nation. In fact, he said many nations. And they, my friends, could not wait on the will of God. So you know what they did? They initiated a little plan of their own. And out of that plan came an Ishmaelite. And Abraham begged God to accept that Ishmaelite. And God never did accept him as his only son. Never did. And my dear friends, the only way God could even bless that Ishmaelite was bless him to be the enemies of the people God had chosen. And by that view them. And now I want you to know, my friend, that work of the flesh is still bringing death. The greatest threat to humanity this hour, a godly humanity, my dear friend, a humanity with a true and living God, is the Islamic religion that's scattered all over the world, and it all started from Abraham and Sarah initiating something on their own. And do you know you don't have them at their worst when they're doing this? You have them at their best trying to do something for God. Yes, sir. They're trying to do something for God. They're trying to help God keep His promises. And they brought forth an Israelite. God did not initiate that in God. God does not stand by what man initiates. God does not bless what man initiates. Brother, Jesus Christ got victory as the Son of Man, first and foremost, because he never got involved in anything the Father didn't initiate. It takes a lot of God to do that. It takes a lot of God to do something he initiates. And I'll tell you, it takes a lot more of God to wait on God till he initiates something. But when he's initiated something, when you hit the storm, all you have to do, and I don't say this lightly, all you have to do, it may be difficult, but you get back to say, God, you started this business. I didn't. You started it. And Lord, if you don't do Hamlet, then I, I'm sunk. And I'll guarantee you, get back there and remind yourself and remind God and remind the devil that what you were involved in, God started it. Amen. And I'll tell you what you'll find, some strength and some victory and some courage Amen. and some direction like you have never had in your life. Jesus never initiated one involvement. He lived a life of submission. Now, I want to get to the next thing. And you pray that I'll be able to deal with this right. Jesus Christ lived a life of renunciation. Listen to me carefully. He said all power had been given him in heaven and in earth. And Jesus Christ could have snapped his finger and done anything that needed to be done. But you know what the Bible says he did? He said, of mine own self, I can do what? Nothing. I mean, he had the power within himself to do something. But he laid that power aside. And the Bible says he lived by another. And if I understand that verse right, it means that, my dear friend, he was a living sacrifice. He was alive, but the Father was the one that did the work through it. And you've heard me say this many times, and I'll say it just to lay the foundation for where I'm really wanting to get to. Jesus Christ really technically never performed a miracle. 
Amen. Now you say Jesus turned the water into wine, raised Lazarus from the dead, fed 5,000, that's true. But my dear friends, if you checked up on it, you find that what happened was that he would say the Father did it. He renounced his ability and allowed the Father to work those miracles through him. You say, why is that important? I'll tell you why it's important. How would you like to go to the grocery store for a $10 item with $5 in your pocket? It would be sort of a confusing mess, wouldn't it? And so many people are under stress because they don't understand this. They're going to buy a $10 item with $5 in their pocket. But look at it a little farther. How would you like to go to the store to buy a $10 item with a million dollars in your pocket? Well, man, that would be quite a comforting situation, as you would. But you see, when you go out, when man goes out to carry out what God has initiated, he does it in his own ability. He goes to the store to buy a $10 item without $10. He's only got what he can afford to do, what he has the ability to do. But when he goes, renouncing his ability and relying on the ability of the Father, then he has all God can do. Amen. That makes a lot of difference. That's sort of a comfortable place. Amen. You say, Brother Manley, you, you, you do not separate the material from the spiritual. Never have. I don't think you do, should. I don't think you should fragment the person. Amen. Yes, sir. Now, are you with me? You still, you're still sure you're with me? When he said he renounced his ability and relied on the ability of another, and if we're to walk, we're to renounce our ability and rely on the ability of another, let me tell you something. Down inside of you, I think what's my name called latent power of the soul. But down inside of me and you is a self-life ability that no man has ever fathomed. And when that, that ability is discovered by man and developed by man, are you listening carefully? There, the world has not yet seen what a man at his best, not God's best in him, but his best, that soul power, the world has not seen yet what that man can do. You and I have that ability. Have you ever had a dream? And when you had that dream, you were awakened out of that dream, and your body had literally gone through different emotions physically, as if you had literally lived out everything you experienced in that dream? That ought to give you some indication of the power of your mind. I go to a Hindu doctor. And she uh, talks about yoga and all that stuff. And she said, Why, well, Brother Manley, you talk about your answers to prayer. She said, You want me to tell you mine? She says, I can take you to hundreds of people that can control a severe blood pressure problem with their mind. <coughs> She said, Brother Manley, I can tell you, you talk about your miracles. She said, I can take you to people who, with their religion, can perform miracles right before your eyes. You say, Satan? No. Uh uh. This is where a lot of us are being fooled today. We say, There's God and Satan, folk. There's another person, and that's man. And man in that soul power has a capacity that you and I know very little about. Yeah. And one of the reasons God can't send the Holy Ghost revival in this world is because you and I are sitting here with a head full of knowledge about God, but we do not know the difference between the soul and the spirit. And a person can get up here and operate in the soul. And you think he's operating in the spirit. Yeah. And you accept what he's doing. 
when God is not in it and Satan is not revealing himself all that's happening is that soul power is taking over amen amen and people do not know the difference and you can't tell the difference by what you hear and you can't tell the difference by what you see the only way you can tell the difference is that you have an anointing in you that you simply know the life of God is not in that person because folks they can move you convince you logically move you emotionally and stir you and you can see every manifestation you would normally see at the hand of God but life and people substitute life for enthusiasm you don't think you, I know what I'm talking about but I know preachers you have listened to lapped up and enjoyed and delighted in and shouted over they were living in hell while you shouted yes sir amen living in sin and you heard them and enjoyed them and delighted them and walked out and said wow glory to God that's God See, the only way you get rid of that old soul life, folk, is get to a place they call uh, Calvary. That's why this new charismatic movement has left Calvary out. Amen. You know why? Calvary is the place where man comes to the end of himself and he becomes dead not only to himself but his ability and out of that Calvary comes the Pentecostal life of God bringing it out of that person life which is much deeper than enthusiasm now, if you think this is bad among preachers, it's five times worse among singers. The black people don't hesitate to tell you they do soul music. They know more about it than we do. Come on. Yes, sir. Not too long ago, a couple of years ago, a man was caught and kicked out of his church for homosexuality. There were six men. His wife got so upset about it, she wouldn't live with him too. Now, I'm going to tell you, it's an awful, ungodly story. And I'm not even telling you all the whole thing. But you know what? That part didn't bother me. Now, it bothered me. I don't mean it didn't bother me. It did. But you know what bothered me? Is you go talk to those people about the things of God. And when that man was operating while he was living in that sin, they said God was here. God was here. Can you still think about how deceived you are? Yeah. Can you think about how deceived those poor people are? They do not know the difference between the life of God and the manifestation of the soul. I can give you one you understand a little bit better than that. I have people tell me, he said, boy, I said, that was a time when old Baker was really walking with God. He said, God led me to give a thousand dollars. Let me tell you something, Bolt. I'm not playing games with you people today. One of the greatest prayer warriors I know live in Denver, Colorado, was reared under Norman, uh, reared under Reese Howell. She said, Brother Manny, the reason God's not sending a mighty revival today 
is because the people of God could not handle it. They do not know how to handle it. Well, the soulish power can sweep through here, or psychic power can sweep through here and set this thing in a raging and a singing and a shouting and a hollering and a hooping or any other thing, my dear friends. And you think it's God. And yet when God comes through, folk, no doubt there's a singing and a shouting and a praising and a rejoicing. But the source is different. You see, Jesus had all that power given him in heaven and earth. You know what he did? He came to him, laid it aside. And he did nothing of his own. He said, I can do nothing except what I see the Father do. That's the reason, folks, God has to break us. Amen. He has to break us. Amen. To break us. You see, you have that heavenly treasure in this earthen vessel. And my dear friends, if you don't know how to lay that vessel at the cross and let God break it, He has to break it. Or that heavenly treasure can't get out. Remember Gideon? Back in the last year, a year ago last December, when I was wrestling with this thing, and my kidneys going bad, and I, I, I just had to, I, I just had to have something from God, and I wrestled for six months about it, six months, folk, before I could get the answer in my hand or in my heart. These fellows run in here and get in the presence of God for ten minutes and come out with worldwide changing experiences. I don't know anything about stuff like that. But for six months, I sought God day and night. And one day, finally, finally God said, He said, turn over there to 2 Corinthians 4. For that heavenly treasure in this old earthen vessel. And He said, this old earthen vessel has got to be broken so that heavenly treasure can get out. And I was happened to read Benson's word study. And he, re- he, he referred me right directly, immediately to Gideon. And Gideon, the army had come to defeat him. And Gideon got his army down to 300 men. <laughs> I'll tell you, wasn't anyone going to get any glory out of that but God. Gideon said, now, I want you to take a lamp, something like a lantern or a picture, really, an earthen vessel, and put that light down inside that earthen vessel. And I want a hundred of you to get over here. And I want a hundred of you to get over here. And I want a hundred of you to get over here. And said, when the trump sounds, I want you to break that old earthen vessel. Lord God, can you see what happened? When they sounded that trumpet, that old vessel, they broke that vessel and the light broke out. And that bunch of devils thought they were gone. And they fled for their lives. It took days for Joshua or Gideon to catch all of them. I mean, friend, it, it moved them out. The light God has to break that vessel. Has to break it. Because we have to be brought to the set what God has initiated. We have to be brought to know that we can't. He can, and he must, or it won't get done. Jesus lived a life of submission. He lived a life of renunciation. I want you to know something. It's not our weakness that's our problem this morning in this congregation. It's our strength. It's our strength. Because when you have strength, folks, you get in God's way. And I'm going to tell you, you have to learn to have this, to lose that strength by getting to the cross by simple submission, or God has to take you there. He's got to break it. Amen. You just think about this. You know this. Everything that was impossible for you to do that you got to God with, it did. It happened. 
But when you think you can do it, you mess it up. See, that's what I'm talking about. Listen. Listen. Jesus Christ lived one more thing about his life as a son of man. He lived a life of obedience. Now, what I mean by that is this. Now, hold on. Buckle your seatbelt down. If you haven't heard me deal with this, because it, it's going it's to it's gonna shake you. Jesus Christ lived in such obedience to the Father that by his very action now, by his action, if God did not work a miracle, Jesus Christ would have been sunk. Now you say, well, Brother Manley, he could have never been sunk. You are looking at him now as the Son of God, not the Son of Man. He had to have the capacity to be sunk, or he would not have been the Son of Man. And let's do it again. We'll say it again. He lived in such a way, my friend, in obedience to the Father, that if the Father had not supernaturally worked, he'd have been sunk. You say, what do you mean? In John 6, isn't it? Where he fed the 5,000? How did he act? Let's see how he acted. He came up there. There was 5,000 men and there was women and children. We don't know how the number. How much the number? How did Jesus act at this place? How did he act? If he'd have done it like humanistically, he'd have said, Now, God, if you give us about 10 tons of fish and about 10 tons of bread, then we'll sit down and have dinner. Is that what he did? Huh. In fact, he turned to Philip and he said, Philip, how are you going to handle this crowd? And by the way, friend, you may not realize it, but every day the Lord is putting you in circumstances to see and let you see how you're going to act. Just like he did Philip. You know how Philip acted? An atheist could have done just as well. How did Philip act? He reckoned with his ability. He said, I've only got about $40. Anybody can do that with their ability. But you know what happened? Here's what Jesus said. Now watch this. They found a lad with two loaves, two fish, and several loaves of bread. They brought that to Jesus. Now what did Jesus do? What's the next thing he said? When he took it, what's the next thing he did? He said, see them. He said, see them. He doesn't have the two fish and five loaves. He said, see them. God on the spot. No. You see, because he didn't initiate this thing. Now that's when people are missing it. And neither was he operating in his own ability. That's the next place they're missing it. You see, God had put him on the spot to see if he would obey without sight, smell, taste, feel, or hear. That's faith. That's right. Faith is obedience, and obedience is faith. Not before, but a- not after, but before you have something. In other words, Jesus Christ, if he was obedient to what the Father was doing, he had to act like he had it when he didn't have it in order for him to have it. Because between him and God, he did have it. That's not a leap into the dark, folk. That's a leap into the light. He said, see them. And he didn't always say, see them there, brother. I've got news for you. He said, he took those fish and loaves, and he bowed his head and thanked the Father for it as if he had enough for everybody. And then, after he thanked the Father and began to break it, it multiplied. Y'all heard me say this for years and you thought I was crazy. 
But I said faith is acting like it's so when it's not so in order for it to be so because with God it is so. That's exactly how Jesus was acting. And if God the Father hadn't came, had not come through and worked a miracle, he would have been sunk. You may not believe it, but it's important to God that you and I learn how to trust him. If you don't think it is, you check the life of Jesus. He taught the Bible. He gave an example of what he taught by his life. And he constantly allowed providence to shut his disciples up to circumstances to teach them to trust him or walk by sight. And he hasn't quit that method of teaching today. If you're wondering if I'm really telling you the truth, won't you look at Lazarus' tomb, the 11th chapter of John? They sent Jesus, a little message to Jesus and said, Lazarus is sick. I mean, he got in the faith position real quick. He said, This is not under death. And then later on, his disciples said, Well, Lord, he's dead. And it looks like Jesus just had to step down and say, Yes, I know. I know he's dead. What do you think? Why, why contradict his statement? He's not contradicting his statement. He is simply separating the material from the physical, spiritual, in one place. In the other place, he wasn't. When he got at Lazarus too, my dear friends, he rebuked, Seth. He rebuked Mary and Martha. He rebuked them. You know why? Because he said, if thou hast believed, if thou canst believe, you can see the glory. He said, in other words, they, they got on him. They hopped all over him for not being there. And he hopped right back. One of the greatest chapters on faith in the Bible is that 11th chapter of the book of John. You know what he said? When he prayed at Lazarus' tomb, this is what he said. He said, Father, I'm praying not for benefit between me and you because we already know what we're going to do. I'm praying for the benefit of this crowd standing around. And then he said, Come forth, Lazarus! And if Lazarus had not come forth, Jesus Christ would have gone down the drain of defeat. You say, oh, but Brother Manley, that's the Son of God. No, we're looking at him as the Son of Man, full of God. It's called obedience. He was obedient to the Father. Now, you may not have put this together, and I will put it together by Thursday morning. But my dear friends, I have again, once again, given you the definition of faith that I gave you yesterday morning. They saw the truth, they were persuaded of it, they embraced it, and they confessed it. And that's, that's what happened in Jesus' life. He allowed the Father to initiate his involvement. That's discovering the truth. He renounced his ability until to, he totally relied on the Father and his ability. Right. And he embraced it. He acted on it. As if it was so when it wasn't so in order for it to be so. Because he had already discovered between him and God it was so. It's faith. All of that together is faith. So Jesus walked in relationship to the Father as the Son of Man by faith. And my friend, listen, and when it was over, it could be said of him what was written of him in this book. That's victory. If you want that victory, you can have that same victory. If Jesus doesn't come, I'm going to lay down this old body one of these days. I don't know how long. Don't you start counting the days. Because he might fool you. And I'm not afraid of the undertaker. Because by the time he gets there, I'm not going to be there. I'm going to be 
on. Well, let me tell you something. If Jesus doesn't come a hundred years from now, I want my grandkids and great grandkids look at the portraits that's left laying around and dust the dust from them. I want them to be able to say, hey, they tell me he was a saint. They tell me he was a man of God. They tell me he was a priest. They tell me this about him. Amen. Folk, I've been to a lot, number of funerals in my day. Boy, it's marvelous when you bury someone that's known as a saint, as a prayer warrior, as a person who's walked with God. You don't have to say anything. You can just point them to Him, for He is the explanation of their life. You can point them to look at look at the look at the seed and the grandkids and the great grand. Look at them. They tell the story. I had a sweet experience in closing. I had a sweet experience a couple of summers ago. I was in Laurel, Mississippi. I've known for years that I had some relatives in that area. I knew their last names. But I had some way never got in touch with them. And one night after service, this man walked up to me and said, I'm so-and-so. Which made him a cousin of mine. <laughs> we talked for a while and fellowshiped. And, and uh, he said, now tomorrow night from my aunt, which is your great aunt, another a person will come. Uh, they're coming tomorrow night. And so that night came, and sure enough, in the congregation, I picked her out because I could see the paper. And when the end of the one is all over, she came up and met me. And she said, Manly said, I think I have something that you would like very much. So uh, the next night she showed up and handed me a sheet of paper. And on that sheet of paper was an article written up in the uh, Baptist paper of Mississippi in about 1929, somewhere along in there. And it said, Mrs. Beasley died and went home to be with Jesus. Boy, I just started telling her since she raised eight manly boys. I'm going to tell you something, folks. All eight of those boys died in Christ. Amen. She married three girls, raised three girls, and all of them married missionaries. She, they said she had no husband. He died early and left her with these kids. But said this woman was always at the church, regardless of the weather and how things were. She was there. They told about how she would shout. They just told about how she walked with God and people couldn't understand it. She raised a crop one year and when she sold the cotton and put all the money in a purse, somehow her purse got lost with all the money for that entire year. Gone down the drain, she didn't have a dime. But how her God brought her through. And it said in last, he said, if you're a child, a grandchild, or a great-grandchild, and that was me, he said, you can be assured that many a night by the fireplace, while the fire was dying out, she spent hours and hours praying for your soul, and that God would use you. And I dusted the dust off of that old piece of paper, friend, and read about a great-grandmother 
that obviously it was said of her what was written of her in this blessed old book <laughs> oh let me tell you something friend we're not playing games this morning it's important how did he do it he lived a life of submission he lived a life of renunciation and he lived a life of obedience and that is faith is it said of you what's written of you that is a definition of what it's all about is it said of you what's written of you